The release of Eli Roth's 2005 Splatterfest Hostel would cause quite the uproar among Slovakian citizens and officials, with many people worried and quite frankly upset with the way that Roth depicted the country as a crime-ridden, unsafe place to be, especially for Americans. Upset that this would result in a serious blow to the tourism economy, the Tourism Agency of Slovakia supposedly even invited Eli out for a full expenses paid trip so that he could experience the country for what it really is. But once all of the controversy started rolling in, Eli responded to it by stating he never meant to offend the country and that the main audience of hostile US citizens didn't even know that the country existed. Drawing comparisons to Toby Hooper's 1974 horror classic, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, stating that movie didn't deter people from visiting, touring or travelling in the state of Texas, so why would Hostel? So what did Eli go and do after upsetting nearly an entire country? Well, he went and did the exact same thing in the exact same country, but this time with the brutality meter turned all the way up to 10. Oh, and Hostel grossing something like 85 million at the box office probably had something to do with that. In the world of Hostel, you might be able to pay to be able to kill someone, but thanks to today's sponsor, instead, you can pay to hunt the killers. Thanks to Hunter Killer for sponsoring today's video. Hunter Killer is a subscription-based immersive murder mystery game with a case that's told over the course of six monthly boxes. Each box is filled with clues and physical items, such as autopsy reports, witness statements and more. Use the clues to solve the ongoing murder mystery, and in the final episode, you'll be able to finally catch the killer. For all of us out here who are interested in the world of horror and crime, Hunter Killer makes for the perfect game night, date night, or even a gift. Contained in the box, you're given everything you need to conduct your immersive investigation, from a letter containing the basic rundown, police reports, email threads, a map of the location, and a handful of evidence. Hunter Killer is perfect for the people who love a big mystery to unravel, with puzzles, ciphers, and good old fashioned investigation work. But if you're not interested in signing up for a subscription box, well how about picking up an all-in-one mystery? They've had such collabs as Nancy Drew, Agatha Christie, and Blair Witch. Not only will you be having fun solving a fictional case, but you'll be directly supporting the investigations of real-life cases, as part of the proceeds go towards the Cold Case Foundation, an organization dedicated to solving real-life cold cases. So if you're interested in what Hunter Killer has to offer, make sure you hit my link in the description and use my code BIGWILL for $10 off your purchase. The movie begins in a similar way to the original, except this time, instead of cleaning surgical equipment and shots of dark, damp industrial rooms, we're seeing someone rifle through the belongings of an American woman before burning any trace of them. Presumably the same type of person who would have been butchering and burning the bodies like they had in the original, and we then pick up directly after the events of the previous movie, with Paxton passed out on a train with his now mangled hand. Clearly meaning that the ending with him kidnapping the hunting club member's daughter obviously isn't canon. That is, unless the little girl has acquired the abilities of a chameleon. He's taken to the hospital to deal with the injuries he sustained while trying to escape the facility, and the police have arrived to begin asking questions about what went down. He explains to them the horrific events that have unfolded at the factory, and the fact that all of the members share a bloodhound tattoo to symbolise being a part of the group even if the tattoo does somewhat resemble a ball bag. But just as he's finished telling the interviewer about the tattoos, the man pulls up his own sleeve to reveal that he has a bloodhound tattoo, before proceeding to violently remove Paxton's insides. Rather luckily for Paxton, it appears to just be a nightmare due to his time at the facility, and that he did in fact manage to make it off the train and back to safety. But rather unluckily for Paxton, after arguing with his girlfriend, who seems to have quite the problem with him suffering from PTSD after the absolutely horrific events that he was subjected to, she walks downstairs the next morning to find Paxton's decapitated body sitting at the dinner table as her cat proceeds to eat the contents of his neck cavity. Well, at least she won't have to deal with his annoying nightmares anymore. They did Paxton dirty by having him immediately die at the start of this movie, especially when you realise that despite all of the horrific odds against him in the first movie, he did manage to triumph and get away. But on the other hand, it does also demonstrate the power and reach that the elite hunting club holds. Him being far away from Slovakia made absolutely no difference to the powers that be. They wanted him dead, so they made sure he was dead. It then cuts to a group of wealthy looking businessmen in suits, accompanied by two bloodhounds sitting at one of their feet, the same dog that the club members all have tattoos of, because subtlety just really isn't their thing, in a business where subtlety should really be their thing. One of the men is then approached and handed a rather suspiciously ominous box that all of the dogs seem to take a great interest in. 
and considering the events of the previous scene, I doubt you need the nose of a bloodhound to deduce what's inside that box. We then get introduced to the sequel's new main cast of characters, confirming that the previous scenes involving Paxton and his rather unfortunate demise were merely nothing more than an F.U. to the people who wanted him to live his happily ever after albeit an incredibly mentally traumatised happily ever after, and a statement insinuating that the group will win no matter what. If the belongings being thrown into the fire in the intro wasn't clear enough, three American women, Beth, Whitney and Lorna, three art students currently in Rome, all taking a class in the art of drawing nude models. Well, when in Rome, after the class, as Whitney and Lorna are talking, we learn that Beth hasn't really got to worry about money, as when her incredibly wealthy mother passed away, a substantial amount of money was left behind for her. So of course they then board the crowded overnight train to Prague, you know, like rich people, and hopefully this train ride won't entail another rather strange meat toucher. While on the train, Beth and Whitney bump into the model from Rome, Excel, as she buys the pair a round of drinks. Eventually, the pair decide to head back to their carriage where their friend Lorna is, and when they were gone, a man entered the room and stole Lorna's iPod from her. Rather luckily for Lorna, or unluckily depending on how you choose to look at it, Excel knocks on the door to their carriage and says that she just found this iPod as somebody tried to steal her bag. With the trust of the women now gained, Excel enters their room and joins them for a few more drinks, where eventually she manages to get the group to skip going to Prague and to instead head right through it and continue onwards to Slovakia, with the promise of an amazing natural hot spring spa. But if movies have taught us anything, it's that Eastern Europe is an evil place. Right? She then takes the group to the same hostel as the previous movie, with the same strange desk clerk and the same dubbed version of Pulp Fiction playing in the background, with everything seeming almost exactly the same as it was when Paxton, Josh and Oli arrived here just a few years back. And perhaps the symbolism of Pulp Fiction playing in the background is merely more than just a nod to Eli Roth's buddy Quentin Tarantino but instead a subtle way to make the American guests feel more relaxed and at home by having something on the TV that they'd clearly recognise. Or you know, it's just because Eli Roth is friends with Quentin Tarantino. Instead of being greeted by a pair of nude women, like the organisation used to originally lure Paxton, Josh and Oli into their clutches, they instead get them interested in the annual Harvest Fair, because chicks love Harvest Fairs. After the clerk takes their passport to check them in, we get to see more of a glimpse into how this elite hunting club operates when it comes to selling their victims. A batch of texts and emails are sent out to all of the wealthy club members, containing a picture, their nationality and their price and it seems that their operations have evolved somewhat since the events of the original movie, with the original film leading you to believe you just show up and pay for what nationality you want. But this time, they've been channeling their entrepreneurial spirits by having the interested parties bid for the opportunity to get access to these soon-be victims, with the prices soaring much higher than the original's 25k for an American. Clearly I'm in the wrong industry. As the women are walking around the village, they're approached by the same group of hoodlum, skull-bashing, candy-eating children from the first movie, leading me to think that it's somewhat surprising that this elite organisation had Paxton hunted down and horrifically killed, yet allowed the children who aided in his escape and killed two of their members to just live. Avoiding the risk of retelling the exact same story, but this time just with women, we see far more of the clients and the people orchestrating the elite hunting club's operations. We meet Stuart and Todd, two men who have purchased these women's lives, as they both fly out to Slovakia to experience the pleasures that it has to offer them. They're booked into a nice fancy hotel and are both taken to be given their bloodhound tattoos to initiate them into the club, raising the question that isn't it awfully suspicious that these men were sent invites to the bidding process before being full-fledged members of the group. Now I'm no expert when it comes to human trafficking or human butchering, but that seems to be somewhat of a security flaw to say the least. Stuart is a far more hesitant type of guy compared to his friend Todd, as when getting his tattoo, Todd emits the same kind of energy as the hunting club member that Paxton met in the changing rooms of the original movie. He's full of energy and excitement, while clearly hyped up at the prospect of ripping the life away from some poor helpless victim. It's like his mum told him he's been a really good boy, so she'll buy him some Robux when they get home. While on the other hand, Stuart is feeling far more trepidation about the situation. Not because he has any issues about taking the life of an innocent victim, no, because he's scared of what his wife might think of him getting a tattoo. Now that's a man who knows what his priorities are in life. That night, the women attend the local fair, and while they're drinking, dancing and having fun, we see that Todd and Stuart are watching them from a distance, almost stalking their prey. 
except their prey will be neatly packaged up and brought to them without them having to actually do anything, knowing full well what he intends to do given the chance. After having a brief but friendly conversation with Beth, after she accidentally throws beer all over him, Stuart slips up for a second as he tells her goodnight Beth, without her ever giving him her name. He casually plays it off, as we see the good-spirited but naive Lorna leaving on a drunken boat ride with a man that she's just met, and unsurprisingly, as soon as she's alone with the man in a dark secluded spot, she's attacked from behind, has a bag placed over her head, and knocked unconscious. The next morning, we hear Todd and Stuart discussing their reasons as to why they want to do such a thing. Not because it satisfies their psychopathic urges, not because it brings them enjoyment to inflict pain, not because of simple curiosity, but because they think it will make them seem more badass to other men, as they believe you can sense it on a person once they've taken a life. Yep, incredibly wealthy businessmen who can afford to do such a thing are concerned about being the toughest kids on the playground. While Beth, Whitney and Excel are all at the spa, they're wondering what could have happened to Lorna last night. But Whitney quickly calms down any worries that Beth might have had by saying that she's probably making breakfast for the guy as we speak, before it immediately cuts to a shot, revealing that she is in fact very much not cooking breakfast for the guy, as she's gagged, restrained and chained upside down. She's brought into a dark, damp room, like cattle to the slaughter at a slaughterhouse, as three men prepare the room for a client, with absolutely no regard for Lorna or her life. After the men leave and turn off the lights, a woman enters the room, removes her robe, and lays beneath Lorna as she desperately tries to break free. But much like cattle being taken to the slaughter, no matter how much she squirms or how much she screams, this is the end of the line for her. The woman picks up a scythe and begins to torment Lorna by slicing it back and forth across her body, relishing in the fact that she's being showered in her victim's blood. As she's done with her enjoyment, she reaches for a smaller blade to finish off the job, and is absolutely covered with Lorna's inside fluids in the process. And it's not the golden shower kind of fluids, it's the you might have a blood disease now kind of fluids. Beth falls asleep at the spa, but wakes up to find everyone including Whitney gone. After looking around in sheer confusion as to why everybody would leave her, she notices that she's being approached by multiple men in black, and not the funky alien kind. She climbs her way out of there and takes off running into the woods, but doesn't get very far as she's attacked by the same kids from earlier, demanding that she gives them a dollar. Surely they're in the position to be demanding a little bit more than a dollar. Someone needs to teach these hoodlums basic economics. Before the kids are able to do any serious damage, Beth is saved by Excel and a man named Sasha. The man who we saw earlier is rather fond of having people FedEx severed heads to him. Excel puts Beth in the car, and we see that Sasha returns to the kids, pulls out a gun, and shoots one of them in the head. Because I guess he's just a really evil kind of guy. Not exactly sure what the point of that was all about. To prove a point to a bunch of eight-year-olds? To tell them how wrong it is to beat up women with large sticks, as he works for an organisation that allows people to beat up women with large sticks? It's not like this scene is necessary to prove just how evil this man really is. We already know that he's involved in human trafficking and the death for cash business. It's not like he gets more despicable than that. He takes the pair back to his home, and Excel reveals that he's an auctioneer, so perhaps that means Sasha is the leader of this organisation, making the previous scene even more questionable in the process. If he was the leader, surely this guy would be incredibly wealthy and powerful, and would definitely not be one of the guys sent to pick up the victims. You'd think that due to his reputation and his line of work, he'd do best to stay out of the public eye. We see that Whitney's already been captured by the organisation, and has been taken to a room to be prepared for her client. But it would seem that Whitney grew up playing I've Got Your Nose a little too seriously, as she bites off the woman's nose and makes a run for it. Not much of a run, as she's almost immediately locked in the corridor and recaptured, but at least she tried. To juxtapose Whitney being prepared for the client in a dark, decrepit warehouse, we see Excel tending to Beth's wounds and applying makeup for her in a grand, clean, sterile home, as she's unknowingly being prepared for the exact same scenario as Whitney. But in the process, she looks up to notice a picture of Excel with the exact same man who stole Lorna's iPod on the train as well as a picture of Excel with Natalia and Svetlana, the two women from the first movie who would go on to serve as human speed bumps. She notices the same men from before arriving at the house to take her away, and accidentally uncovers a secret room full of Sasha's severed head collection. And while I watched this, I only made the joke about Sasha being a collector of human heads, due to him clearly having Paxton's head delivered. I didn't think he would be an actual severed head collector. Amongst the poor, bodiless victims, you can see Eli Roth's head, the director of the first two Hostel movies. 
I guess Sasha gets a lot ahead. Beth's captured and made unconscious by the men, and we see that Todd and Stuart have been informed that it's now their time. We can tell by each of their attire, their thoughts on the situation, and how seriously they're taking it. With Todd being incredibly serious about the entire thing, well dressed in a nice suit, with him being absolutely certain that this is something he wants to do, if not needs to do. While on the other hand, we see Stuart dressed in casual jeans and a jumper, as it reflects his meek and uncertain nature that we've been shown of him so far. They're driving to the same factory from the first movie, now far more heavily fortified, with solid metal fencing, armed guards with rifles, and attack dogs due to Paxton's previous escape. And for a brief second, we see a shot of Stuart looking out of the window that is incredibly reminiscent of a shot of Paxton, as he looks out of the window when arriving, uncertain about the future, and not entirely sure what lays in wait for him. The men enter and inspect the weapons on offer for them, put on their protective suits, and are taken to their rooms. As Stuart enters his room, we can see that he's almost as afraid as the victim is that's bound in front of him. Stuart has Beth, meaning that Todd more than likely has Whitney. He should be alright, as long as he keeps his nose away from her. Stuart begins to panic and freak out, as the sudden realisation about what's happening actually begins to sink in. He breaks and tells Beth everything, insisting that he doesn't actually want to kill her. Well, that's right before he just straight up punches her in the face. A bit much with those mixed signals there, Stu. And we see that Todd is finally given access to what he's been craving this entire trip. Right from the beginning, as you see him win the bidding war, you can see the sheer excitement emanating from him at the prospect of being in this very room and having this opportunity right in front of him. Incredibly excited, he begins to terrorise the poor woman with a power saw, and while not looking, accidentally mangles her face with it. Very quickly changing his entire attitude towards the situation, with him quickly realising that no, this is not what he wants to be doing, and in fact he wants to leave. And as he's trying to go, he's arguing with one of the men, with the man telling him that he can't leave until a life has been taken, as that is part of the contract. More than likely, so that the organisation would have leverage over them if they ever did try to inform the authorities. It's a little bit hard to snitch on an organisation of elite hunting club members who kill people when they have you on camera as an elite hunting club member killing people. In the elevator on his way out, his tough guy bravado facade completely crumbles as he falls to the ground, sobbing and gagging at the thought of what he's just done. The contract states that a life must be taken before being allowed to leave, but it doesn't specify which life must be taken. So as the elevator doors open, the attack dogs are let loose on Todd, tearing him to shreds in the process. Still having the money that Todd paid for Whitney with, the organisation, with their business savvy ways, decides to host their quick, in-house auction for a soon-to-be-dead Whitney, now at a greatly reduced price. They wrap her face up and take a picture door-to-door -door of all the currently visiting hunting club members, where they knock on the door of Ruggero Diodato, the director of Cannibal Holocaust and the grandfather of Cannibal Exploitation and Found Footage movies. Rather fittingly, and a not-so-subtle nod to his work, the King of Cannibals is slow slowly cutting up his victim for perhaps one of the most expensive pieces of foreign cuisine. While Stuart is being shown the offer for Whitney, he sees Todd passing in the corridor. Or rather, would I say, Todd's mangled remains being wheeled past him in the corridor, and decides, yes, he does want Whitney, simply just to be able to torture Beth with that fact. Once the deed is done, he returns to Beth and places Whitney's necklace around her neck, indicating to her that her best friend has just met a rather grisly demise, before he then proceeds to talk to Beth as if she's his wife. Come on, Stu, extreme homicidal LARPing is no substitute for old-fashioned couples therapy. Clearly Stu's sudden change in personality, while perhaps being the direct result of an untreated mental condition, is actually years of pent-up aggression and rage towards his wife. The rage that he's simply not been able to release due to nagging little reasons like the law, his kids, and social expectations. Damn social expectations. After removing the restraint from Beth with the intention of violating her, he unintentionally gives her the opportunity to break free, hit him with a crowbar, and then tie him to the chair. After spending all of this time, money, well Todd's money, and effort to get the ability to stand in this room, he's immediately duped in the span of about 15 seconds and now finds himself as the victim. Beth manages to take a gun from a guard as he comes to investigate the room, before holding a pair of scissors to Stuart's manhood and demanding that she talks with Sasha. For some reason, the group of psychopathic killers don't just immediately kill them both, because why not? They already have the money paid for Beth, and clearly aren't bothered about killing potential customers. She tells Sasha that she wants to pay her way out of here, and that she absolutely has the means to do so. 
That's fine, all these guys care about his money in the end, but Sasha tells her what all paying customers must know. Somebody needs to die for the other person to be able to leave. But Stuart makes that decision a rather easy one for Beth, as he calls her the naughty c-word, resulting in her squeezing down on the scissors and slicing everything off in the process. She picks up Stuart's, well, package, throws it to the bloodhounds to eat, and tells them to leave him to bleed to death. She gets the tattoo to become a member, and much like how Paxton did at the end of the original movie, enlists the help of the local hooligan children to lure Excel out into the woods before cutting her head off with a battle axe for revenge, as if she's been playing too much Skyrim recently or something, before the kids proceed to play a friendly game of football with the woman's decapitated head. Well, when life gives you lemons, I guess. And then the movie then comes to an end, with Beth walking free as the newest member of the Elite Hunting Club. Before we finish, I'd like to let you guys know that my clothing brand, Morbid Minds, has just launched, so if you like anything that you see here, make sure you head down to the description to check us out, or go to morbidminds.co.uk. Don't forget to check out my Twitter as well, because I crave that little dopamine hit I get when my follower count goes up. And before we finish this video off, I'd like to say a big thank you to my patrons. Thank you to Dom, Hunters263, Rebecca Pitts, A Dandy in Space, Martin Brannan, Natasha Twyman, Rin and Whiskey, Jared C. Bees, Nicholas, Pascal Mathis, Fighting the Pirates, Richard McGowan III, Macy J, Reese Harford, Horatio, Ramey Patterson, Chris, Michelle, Newcomb, Dennis, Wade Knott, Ike, Mr. J2, Ashley L. Wince, Austin Wipert, Christopher Butsky, Jack the Riddler, and Joshua Torres. Thank you so much to my patrons, and thank you to everyone else for watching.